back in the air. We're going, let me just read a little more. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus is coming back from the portals of heaven in the air. I don't know, but there's somebody said this one time. He said, why isn't Jesus coming on down to the earth? They said, well, he did that one time, and they beat the daylights out of him. They're not going to do that again. <laughs> he said, hey, this far, hope you're coming to me. How you coming down? Never mind. <laughs> but what you and I just read was the people who have died in Christ, them that are, them that are born again and, and buried, are going to be raising their bodies. They're going to be raising the dead. Well, people make this argument. What about them with the animals? They listen. If man can take DNA and reconstruct the whole body, mm -hmm. you know God's got to be that smart. Yeah. That DNA is out there. I mean, the depths of the sea. I don't know. It doesn't make any difference. They're, they're, they're not lost. God knows where they are, and He knows how to do that reconstruction. But the dead in Christ shall rise first, and says, "Then which uh, are alive remain shall be caught up to be with the, you know in the clouds." It doesn't matter what you and I think about or don't think about. It. That verse says somebody's going to be caught up. There are people tell you there's not going to be nobody caught up, but you're going to have to take your scissors and cut that out. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Yes. I thoroughly intend to be part of that crowd. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord Parsley said the other day, he said, the rapture comes. He said, you better not be standing too close to me. If you ain't saved, you better get away from me. Because he said, when I go up, I'm grabbing the closest one to me. And he said, we going up. And said, I, you get saved until I turn loose. No pressure. <laughs> like 40,000 feet, you want to drop or get saved. <laughs> anyway, all jokes aside. This text right here is talking about the rapture of the church. Going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, okay? I mean, we could spend a while just talking about that. But, but, but just what we looked at and what we covered here. It's, it's pretty self-evident that the dead in Christ are going to be raised from the ground and, and that generation that's alive when the Lord comes back in the air in the clouds, we all going up to meet him. Okay. I don't know if you took the time to find it or not, if anybody else in here knows where it's at. I, I've got it in my notes someplace. We just need to hunt it up. But there's that group that the Bible talks about. This, in fact, but, but let me just say this right quick. This particular text right here is where the righteous are being taken away from among the wicked if we can use those terms. The only ones left on this planet are the unsaved. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be right? Mm -hmm. yes. Those that are in right standing with God just got caught up. Yeah. So all that's left on this planet is the unsaved. It's at that point when what I understand the Bible is talking about is this great tribulation of the last uh, seven years of, of the church age. I don't know if you can use that term or not. I think like the great tribulation is an age unto itself. But the great tribulation period begins at that point. When this whole world, or at least most of this world, when it dawns on them where we went, because there's multitudes going to figure that out. We've talked to them for years and years and years. We're, we're, the rapture's coming. You need to get right. The rapture's coming. Jesus is coming. We're going to be caught up in there. And directly they're going to look around. And millions of people are gone. Yeah. And it's going to dawn on our thinking. Yeah. Hey, them lunatics weren't such lunatics. <laughs> and therefore, people are going to turn to the Lord. Now, people have said that. Have you found that? Okay. I'm really not sure what you want me to look for. Well, two in the field, one be taken. For the wicked are going to be severed from yeah. that. Yeah, right. I think, I think it's in Luke. I don't know. But anyway. Uh, hey, Brother Charlie, come in, my friend. Good to see you. Uh, I have a tremendously good idea. You would have loved it. Nobody knows what it was. I don't either. <laughs> Forgot it. It's going to dawn on them that we went to heaven? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> I just tell you, I knew that. <laughs> there, there, there's many have said that, that, that this rapture thing, this rapture moment, <clears throat> that the Spirit of God and the church and all is leaving this planet, and the whole thing is at the mercy of Satan. Well, part of that is true, but the Spirit of God is not leaving this planet. Because if the Spirit of God left this planet at that time, nobody could get saved. Mm -hmm. Nobody can say Jesus Christ is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a relationship with the Lord, a, 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 a relationship established with the Lord without the Spirit of God being present to get that done. Okay, so the Holy Ghost is going to be here. The reason they say that is because the Holy Spirit, they believe, is the restraining factor that is holding Satan at bay right now so that the devil doesn't just take over the whole world and just destroy it like he wants to do. The Holy Ghost is here, but when the rapture comes, the Holy Ghost is taken out, so the devil has a free shot to destroy the whole world. That's just not true. 
The church is what's holding the devil at bay right now. You and I are the one that's rebuking the devil and the Holy Ghost is our helper. When we're taken out of here, there's nobody stopping Satan from doing what he wants to do. Which is one reason Jesus said there'll never be a, been a time like it nor ever be a time like it because of how terrible this world's going to be during that seven year period. Matthew, well, I just missed it half a Bible, that wasn't bad. Goodness. It said Luke, it's in Matthew. <laughs> anyway, this this whole thing in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is all about the church and raptured out of here. That's going to happen, people. 1 Corinthians 15, I think it said, we're going to be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, that moment, the Greek is an atomic, it's, it's faster than the bat of an eye. It, it, you change quicker than you can bat your eye. Okay? And somebody made this statement. I don't know. I guess it makes, makes sense. They asked the Lord, why, why are you doing that so quick like that? And they said the Lord told them he'd have to raise people from the dead all over the planet if he did it any other way. Because, you know, there's a lot of folks on this planet that if they have time to think about it, their heart would fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's people who, <clears throat> you know, they have weak hearts to begin with. And, and, and something of that nature... It just happened to them, and, and they uh, they uh, have time to reason that out in their mind. It just scared the daylights day out of them. But it just happens so fast. One second you're one thing, and one second you're something else. Okay. Did you find that? Uh, Matthew thirteen forty nine. Turn turn over your Bible, Matthew thirteen forty nine, and uh, read that. Right? <clears throat> so it shall be at the end of. The age, it should say, is in the world. That's in the church age, yeah. yeah. So shall it be at the end of the age, the angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Right. The angel is going to come and sever the wicked from among the just. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we just read here, it's a just been severed from among the wicked. Well, let's deal with She just read in Matthew, what chapter was it? 13. 13. It's, it, it's a whole message in itself. We, we, we spent a whole hour on, I think, maybe two Sundays. I don't know if you walk back, but... <clears throat> you, can, you can read in the Bible where it says that, that blood is going to be at the horse's bit, the, the horse's bridal bit, deep in the valley of Megiddo in Israel. And it says that valley is 1,600 furlongs long. 1,600 furlongs long, that valley is. Well, I thought, well, how long is... 1,600 furlong. Well, I first had to figure out what a furlong was. A furlong is one-eighth mile. 1,600 one-eighth miles is 200 miles. I mean, if calculators are working right at all, I don't know, that's just what I come to. It's 200 miles. That's almost the length of Israel, the, the north and south of Israel. That valley is somewhere around 10. I mean, you, I'm, I'm not found the exact distance of the width of it, but just from the observation of it, it appears to be anywhere from 10 to 15 miles wide. The Lord is going to take all the unjust people on this planet, the wicked, that is according to Matthew 13, is that it? He's going to take all the people that don't have a relationship with God and put them in that valley. And when he gets through, there's going to be blood the depth of a horse's bridle. That's a lot of blood. But then there's going to be a lot of people there. The Lord is going to clean the planet up. Many of the people that are alive during the Great Tribulation will give their life to maintain a relationship with the Lord, but there are a lot of people that's going to go into the millennial reign who didn't give their life for the Lord that have a relationship with God. Because flesh and blood is going to repopulate this planet in the millennial reign. They're going to get married and have children. Got to have flesh and blood to get that done. During that same period, the Bible says the church, the born again body of believers, it was called out here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, are going to be the government of this world. With President Jesus over there in Jerusalem. But everything that's. Let me just show you what everything is. Look, look at Revelation uh, uh, 22. What? Let me read Revelation 14 20 because it's what you've been talking about. Revelation Yeah. Revelation 14, 20 says, And the wine press was trodden without the city, 
and blood came out of the winepress even to the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. Yeah. In Revelation fourteen twenty. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's two hundred miles. Talk about the wrath of God. Yeah. How many people can you put in a two hundred mile long valley? And. 15 mile wide. I mean, that's a pretty wide valley. I, I'm not found the exact measurements of that, but I've seen a lot of photos of it. But all the people who do not have a relationship with God, there's a moment coming when Jesus, the angel is going to take all them people and put them in that valley over there. But when is this going to happen? At the, end, at the end of the seven year tribulation. tribulation. Yeah. Okay. The church left here at the beginning of it. And that's at the end of the second year tribulation, which is the same thing as the second coming of Christ. Well, we're going to look at that in just, oh. just a moment. Calm down. Uh, hold on. <laughs> hold on. Man, gotta have the Holy Ghost in life. <laughs> anyway, uh, Revelation 20, 21, verse 27. There's another verse that I'm looking for. I'm not seeing it yet. We'll just work with this for a moment. 21, verse 27. It says, There shall in no wise enter in, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever works an abomination or makes a lie, but, that, but only those who have written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And, and what it's really referring to there is uh, uh, New Jerusalem and this, and this millennial reign thing. It's millennial reign, you understand what that is? It's a thousand year, millennium means a thousand years. It's a thousand year period from the time the end of the Great Tribulation period to when time is declared to be no more. A thousand year period. That Jesus and the church are going to reign on this earth. Okay. What happens after that? Anybody's guess. I believe it's really gray after that as far as the Bible goes. I know some people think they know some things that the Bible says. I just haven't got that. Part figured out yet, okay? But the point I want to make just for the moment is there's two catching of ways. One is the church and the other is the ungodly. The church goes and bees with, goes and bees with Jesus <laughs> in heaven. But all that do not have a relationship with God are going to be caught off this planet and put south of this planet and taken to the Valley of Megiddo over in Israel. And that's where all these vultures and buzzers are going to be called to the great supper of the Lord. I, uh, that's not the marriage supper, but it's something called it the King James called them eagles, but uh, there's a whole host of reasons why that's not eagles. It's just something he did. It's it's vultures. It's 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 uh, carrying buzzards is what it is. Okay, that are going to feed on that flesh of wood. The Lord's going to clean the planet up. Just a pastor thing on my part, you understand, but I strongly suggest you don't be in that crowd because the Bible will be fulfilled. <clears throat> it's going to happen just like it says. Somebody's going to go up and be with the Lord in heaven, and there's a whole bunch of people going to wind up over in that valley of Megiddo in Israel. And Jesus, the Bible says, he's going to try the wine press of God. He's going to kill them all. He's just going to kill them. Because he's already taken them all. Yeah. And, and they, They've made their decision to reject God. Yeah, right. And he's just going to, you know, it's just death is going to be on them. All right, look at uh, Revelation chapter 4. Let me show you something. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 is saying the same thing that 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about. Verse 1 in Revelation chapter 4 says, after, the Apostle John said, After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Anybody want to take a guess what that door is? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the door. Mm -hmm. You don't come into heaven to him, you ain't coming in. Okay? So it's talking about Jesus, this door is. It was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says there's a voice of the trumpet's going to blow, and the church is out of here. Okay? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 is talking about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, what we just read with the rapture's concern. But it says, the voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, and it said, come up hither. Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there's some folks coming up thither. <laughs> going up thither. Going to be caught up to be the Lord. And he said, I'll show these things which must be hereafter. Now you can do your own study, but let me just make a blanket statement here, okay? From first, or excuse me, from Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 to Revelation 19, you cannot find the church. The church is not in there. Tons of Bible teachers and preachers try to preach that they are, but they're not. The church is gone in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. So everything you read between that verse. In Revelation 19, if you'll just go there with me for just a minute. Uh, verse 11 in Revelation 19. 
John said, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and righteousness he does judge and make war. You may want to take a guess who that is. That's Jesus. That's the Lord Jesus, okay? And his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a, with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That blood that, that his vesture dipped in was that crowd that was in that valley in the ghetto. Their blood. We, we go ahead and find that in other places. But look at verse 14. It says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And, well, let me just say something right quick. Wherever you find the term, the word linen, fine linen, white linen, every time in the entire Bible I know anything about it. We did a whole study on show one night. It's always talking about the righteousness of the saints. You know the, 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 the night Jesus was betrayed by Judas and they came and took him captive. And, and uh, there's a couple little snapshots thrown right in the middle of that. They come out there with the soldiers and the high priest and, the, and, and all those guys with swords and clubs and I don't know what. One little picture in that moment is where Peter drew a sword and cut the guy's ear off. You ever reading that? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, hey, hold everything, put your sword up. Pick the guy's ear up, stick it back on, heal me. That'd be a pretty remarkable moment, you know, if you were there. That's just stuck in there, just kind of like it really didn't. I mean, what's that got to do with Jesus being taken captive? But it does. And the picture of the statement that, that makes to you and I is, when persecution comes for our relationship with God, you need to be really careful how you use this sword. Because this is called the sword of the Spirit. And if you don't use it in love, speak the truth in love, you can cut somebody's hearing and slick off where they will never hear the Word of God again. Nothing short of a miracle of God will they ever mean to hear, be able to hear God again. Y'all see that picture? That at least is what's going on in that little picture. There may be other things. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure there are. I mean, the Word, the word of God's infinite. That's one picture you find where that, where that, in that Garden of Gethsemane where they come and rest the Jesus. But here's this other little picture just thrown right in the middle of it. It just doesn't seem like it has a thing to do with anything. But it says there was a young man there clothed in linen. Remember reading that? And they said, hey, guys, get him. He's part of this gang. He broke the run. Remember reading that? Mm -hmm. And he dropped his linen and ran off naked. And that's all it says about it. I thought, well, what's that guy in there for? What's that got to do with this whole thing? Again, when the persecution comes, because the Bible says all live God in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, it's going to come to one of us. I mean, it's already in measure. Our Constitution has protected us considerably, but we're not exempt. But when persecution comes to you, don't abandon your righteousness. Don't go be like that crowd that you're trying to get saved just to avoid persecution. To do that, you've abandoned your righteousness. You dropped that linen cloth and went over here and just hooked up with the semi crowd. No, I'll just tell you up front, you already know. Jesus said they hate me, they're going to hate you. And we just need to get over it now. We don't like rejection. We don't like people hating us. But the Lord already said, that world is not Jesus friendly. They don't like you. we got a president doing his best to eliminate our Constitution so he can eliminate your religion. Your Christianity. He made a statement on national TV just the other day. He said, the founding fathers of this nation... If it were not for what they had said, I could get a lot more done. I thought, excuse me? You operate within the boundaries of what the founding fathers created with our Constitution. You don't try to get rid of it and do what you want to do. But that's exactly what he's trying to do. Anyway, in Revelation 19, this verse 14, is the church coming back with Jesus. Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the Jesus coming for the church. Revelation 19 is Jesus and the church, or the church is coming back with Jesus. Okay, But between Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and Revelation 19, I mean, there's a lot of truths in there, a lot of good things that you know, we can draw out there and, and add to our life and be blessed by it. But the church is not there. Hallelujah. That's good. That, that's good news. I don't know what your question was a while ago, but that's my answer. <laughs> Saved, are they going to have to convert to Jews, become Jews, 
In the tribulation period? Yes. No, the Jews are going to convert to Christianity. Because the Bible says they are going to behold the one that is pierced and mourn for this Christ. And re recognize that they yeah. got crucified. They were the <laughs> they but, you know, it's an interesting question because as, as, you, as you read, as you read with the tribulation, what's going on in the, Let me just back up a little bit. That, that Daniel chapter 9 thing where Daniel 70 weeks is concerned. Between verse 26 and 27, there's a 2,000 year gap. 2,000 year period of time gap between the two verses in Daniel chapter 9. And you really have to study that to find that out. But from the time of Christ's crucifixion until the rapture of the church, the Jewish clock stopped. Now God's working with the Jewish people. He's blessing the Jewish people, but he's really working with the church during this, what we call the church age. It's grace dispensation. But when the church is raptured out of here, the church clock stops and he turns the Jewish clock back on and he finishes out that last week of Daniel or the, or the 70th week of Daniel. And when he does that, all the, all the ceremonies and all the stuff that they did on the law will be picked up and continued in that seven, 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 seven week. I mean, they're, they're keeping the Sabbath. They're doing all the ceremonies that you find under Moses' law. I mean, the Lord, I mean, God, God stopped the, mo the law of Moses at the crucifixion of Christ. And so you got a 2,000 year gap for the churches here on the planet. But when the church leaves to finish out that last week, the church isn't even here. So that, that, that clock is gone. The, ch the church, church clock is. So the Lord turns the Jewish clock back on. Okay? And they continue back doing just what they did under the law of Moses for that last seven years. That's why instead of praying that your, that your flight not be on the Sabbath and I don't know, some other things. Well, that's concerned. And that's to those that are in Jerusalem. It's specified. Those that are in, in Judea. 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 Not Jerusalem, but Judea. Judea. I read that and I thought, sure, they're only talking about mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm moving to Kansas City. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, in the Old Testament, the rest of the people besides the Jews were welcome to come in and be a part of the Jewish beliefs and traditions. Right. In the church age, the Jews are welcome to come right. and be a part of the church. Right. But in that great tribulation, Jacob's trouble and other things that it's called, uh, the Jewish race or the Jewish people are going to try to continue that law of Moses and, and, and that whole system under Moses' law. But there's a moment coming under that that it's going to dawn on them that they crucified the Lord of glory back in Jerusalem 2,000 years earlier. And that whole, and, and Paul said it this way, all Israel be saved. Well, it's all the living Israel at that time. They said they'll mourn for Christ when they realize who he is and what he did as a, as a, as a, as a man would mourn for his only son that was killed. I'm going to read that about it. So you got this rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The church is out of here. Uh, great tribulation begins. Seven year, that seven year period of tribulation begins at that moment. When, that's, when that happens, somewhere during that period, that, that last seven years when, before the millennial reign, the angels take everybody who don't have a relationship with God. The angel goes around to every one of them on this planet and puts them in the valley of Megiddo. And that's where they die. At the end of that seven year period, there's going to be tons of people on this planet that didn't give their life for Christ. Many of them will, but there's going to be a lot of them that don't, and they're the ones that are going to repopulate this planet in the millennial reign. And uh, it says a child will play with the snakes, and the lion lays down with the lamb. And as you read that, flesh and blood is a perfect piece of flesh and blood. So for that to happen, flesh and blood has to, be, has to go enter into that millennial reign. So everybody that has a relationship with God does not. The Antichrist doesn't kill all of them. A lot of them will, a lot of them die. And then until that, you know, and then Satan bound for a thousand years at, uh, at the end of that seven year period and uh, it says, Cursed be the sinner that lives to be a hundred year old. Remember reading that in Revelation? I think, well, Isaiah maybe it is. Uh, and the reason it says that, here's, a hundred, here's an individual that's a hundred years old and he still not chose Christ to be his Lord. And he's done that without any temptation to not receive Christ as his Lord. The Bible says, that didn't live as cursed. It said, men will live as trees. The trees get pretty old. 
there won't, I don't think, I mean, there'll be death during that time, but you know, you, you'd be really old before you die in the tribulation, I mean, in the uh, millennial reign. And if there's any sin going on during that time, it's just because you decided to do it, or people who have lived there decided to do it, because it's not because they were tempted to do it, Satan bound. It's just an interesting thought to me. Jude, not Jude, but James said, you're led astray and enticed and tempted by the lust of the flesh, even though Satan be bound in that millennial reign. People during that period still have the flesh to deal with. But I think that fallen endemic nature is still in the flesh at that time. And if they, you know, even suddenly, even though Satan's bound, they're still going to have to have some restraint on their thought processes. And then that gets off in the areas that I go thinking, Lord, what did I bring it up for? <laughs> I go thinking, why Marsha bring it up anyway? <laughs> no. it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It really is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The church is going to be caught up, seven year tribulation, all hell breaks loose on this planet. <clears throat> the birds will come by and pick your eyeball out. You, I mean, the birds, everything will be demon possessed. There's no, nothing to restrain the devil at that time because the church is the only one doing that. That's the reason the Antichrist will not be revealed who he is until the church leaves. I mean, you know, you got like a billion born-again believers on this planet and then the Antichrist says, hey, I'm taking over. You know what the church is going to do then? Mm -hmm. That turkey rule the day he ever showed himself, you know, because the church will take him out. Yeah. But when the church leaves here and the Antichrist is revealed, there's nothing to stop him from doing whatever he wants to do. He's going to do a lot of signs and wonders in those days. I would call them lion wonders, but people are going to believe it. Mm -hmm. Call far down from heaven, and a lot of other things he's going to do. And then he's going to say, hey, by the way, I'm God. Worship me or die. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people die. Yeah. But a lot of people worship him. But eventually they figure out who he is, and it all changes. But anyway, church leaves here in seven-year tri tribulation. God cleans the earth up. Millennial rain starts and a thousand years of, of life on this planet. With Jesus and the church as the government. Y'all get that picture? But yet there'll be fleshly people here yeah. too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who will they be? The, the, the people that were right with God that went out the other end of the great tribulation, that seven year period. So who got saved during the tribulation? Right. right. Those, Those who got saved yeah. during the tribulation. Right. But didn't die. But didn't die. Yeah. Yeah. What's going to happen to the ones that did die? That were beheaded? If they were beheaded for uh, Christ's sake, mm -hmm. you can find in Revelation where it says that these were beheaded for Christ's sake and for his testimony. He said, hey, God, do something to people on earth. And the Lord says he gave them robes of righteousness and said, be patient until your brethren are killed like you are. Remember that in Revelation? Uh, there are a lot of people going to give their life to Christ. They're going to heaven. Okay. So when are they going? I mean, when will they meet with everybody? That's what I said a while ago. We've got a rapture of the church. The first Thessalonians is four. And then we're talking about the uh, another rapture, as it were, for the unjust are being taken to another place. But I said there's other raptures as well. The 144,000 are going to be caught up. All of them that get saved under their ministry and the ministry of angels are going to be caught up at that time. All of them that die for righteousness' sake are going to be caught up to be with the Lord. The two witnesses that give their life over Jerusalem are going to be caught up to be with the Lord. The several raptures are going to take place in, in that seven year period. But there's a whole bunch of people on this planet that uh, uh, are right with God. They were not caught up. They were still on this planet. About the time the devil's put in his place and the seven year period of tribulation is over with, they are who populate this earth during that thousand years of the rain. They're going to build houses, grow farms, grow crops. I'm just. So pleased with myself that I explained that so well, <laughs> which, which means just the opposite. <laughs> it's you know it, it's a really short question, but has a great big answer to it. Um, what are you looking for? Uh, I, I just saw it in Revelation, my book, which talked about those that were beheaded for the sake of Christ. Yeah, in yeah. Tribulation, they were there. Yeah. Um, One of the things that that, that people get confused about is. The church age we're living in right now, I mean, you read Ephesians and other places that we're called the saints, saints of God. But you go over here in, the, in, the, in, in Revelation and you find where there's this tribulation people, they're called saints. 
And so there's people who confuse the two as being the same group, but they're not. One are called tribulation saints, and the other is church age saints. And they think that because these are both saints, that they're all one body, and what happens to one happens to the other. But that's not true. The church age saints is going to be the rapture. Being caught up, we call it the rapture. Folks say, well, rapture is not in the Bible. Why use it? Well, in the original writings, rapture was in it, in, in the earliest manuscript. But besides that, the word Bible is not in the Bible, but we use that all the time. I mean, just because something's not in the Bible doesn't mean you don't use it. Anyway, still there? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get me a big old board about the size of that. I think one of the days we just draw a timeline on it. Uh, to show the timeline of <clears throat> church age, tribulation, the, uh, and the millennial reign, and who's where, and doing what. John, John Hagee's got a real good chart on that. Let me call him on his day. See if I can't get one of them in here explain it. You can see it better than I can tell it. But in First Thess Thessalonians chapter 4, the church is called up. Jesus coming for the church. We'll say it that way. Jesus coming for the church. Revelation 19, the church is coming back with it. And between those two moments, a seven-year gap of uh, something called Jacob's Trouble. It's called, uh, it's called uh, the uh, Great Tribulation. Uh, it has some other names. I forget what they are now. But you don't want to be here. It won't be perfect. And I'll just tell you something. For the sake of those watching the camera, I'll tell you something. If you can't live for Jesus now, you're not about to live then. As a rule. Some will be tough enough to give their life. And they, and they will. They'll, 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 it'll dawn on them what has happened to the church and, and what happened to Grandma and Aunt Matilda and all and Uncle George and all them guys. And they'll just say, bless God, if it costs my life, I'm going to live for Jesus. Well, it, by and large, will. You know? But then there's a lot of them that... Hilton Sutton made this statement one time. I, you know, I've got to check him out. I'll just tell you what he said. He said, much of what you see the Antichrist says he's going to do in, in, uh, in Revelation... Or the, or the man of sin. I said the Antichrist. He's called the man of sin. The word Antichrist is not in, in the book of Revelation. But the man of sin, much of what it says he's going to do is what he plans on doing. But he says, you read, you study, he never gets it done. He only really dominates about a fourth of this planet. I'm not sure Mount Judah will ever get in the crosshairs of the Antichrist. Maybe he will. I don't know. Anyway. I'm not the best prophecy teacher in the world. I just do know, uh, I know the picture that I've tried to paint here, the church being called up, seven years tribulation, and uh, Jesus coming back with the church. Church is, the government is set up on this earth, and Jesus is the head of the government in Jerusalem, the church reigning over the earth, and then uh, the earth being repopulated in that thousand year period with people. A lot of questions, I'm sure, it's in that. No. What did you find? Revelation 7, um, 11 to 14. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, and thanksgiving and honor and power to mine. We enter our God forever and ever. And one of the elders answered, saying, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. The, the came out of great so that right there tells you there's going to be saved in tribulation. Yes. There's going to be some yes. change in yes. tribulation. Yeah, but still you didn't, uh, the, 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 the ones that were beheaded for the witness of Christ beneath the altar, you didn't. Mm -hmm. Did you just read that? Yeah, they, these are they which came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, let's see. Uh, and they shall hunger and thirst no more, neither shall the sun light upon them, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them. You've not found it yet, I don't think. That's not what they're no, that's because, good though because that yeah, right there proves that right. there's going to be those same tribulations. Yeah. this text that I'm th speaking of and what she was originally looking for it says the same thing as well uh, those that were beheaded for the witness of Christ were beneath the altar what does that mean I don't know what you and I understand of an altar to be here is not exactly what's in heaven 
I've not been to heaven. I know a lot of people say they have been. And uh, I, you know, a, lot of, a lot of I believe and a lot of I wonder about. But they say the altar in heaven is huge. We're talking miles in length and breadth. And you got to know anything that God sits on has anything to do with it. has got to be big. Include your throne. You know, I found it. There, Revelation 7 9 through 14 is to me is what, is what that's talking about. By the way, while we're on that subject, let me just go ahead and I guess punctuate with this thought. In this resurrection of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the church, the dead in Christ, I don't have the last word on this by no means. But the Bible says that we'll stand before the Lord and be judged. And that word, that word judge, which means, is the Greek word, the bema seat, which means the Lord will hand out rewards for what we have done here. Okay. You'll be judged for your works. You'll be rewarded for your works that you've done here since you got saved. But there are some people whose works demand the same reward that Satan gets. Born-again people that demand the same reward that Satan gets. Because he's going to put sheep on one side and goats on the other side, and a bunch of them going to hell. That's the first resurrection. You can read in Revelation chapter 20 where it says the second resurrection, or the, or the, or the uh, well, let me just read it here, I think. Yeah, and go read four. Is that what you're talking about? Start at the first four, I think. And uh, what chapter? Twenty-four. Twenty-four. No, twenty. Twenty. Verse okay. Four. Uh, I guess that's where I started reading. Really. He said, "I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast nor his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads nor on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years." Let's that, that, that's people who got right with God during the tribulation period is what that verse 4 is all about. Okay. That was referring to the same thing that you read. Mm -hmm. But that verse 5 is what I was really going to with what I was saying, talking about. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Everything that's ever born again is going into the first resurrection. Ain't all of them going to get to stay in heaven. Some of them going to hell. But them that never had a relationship with God will not be raised from the dead till the end of that thousand year period. They'll stand before the great white throne and be judged for their rejection of Christ. Yeah. The Bible says they'll be cast in the lake of fire with Satan and his angels. So you can be saved, go to heaven, then be, get put with the goats and then go to hell? Just depending on how you live your life. If you didn't live right? You live for the devil, you get a devil's reward, born again or not. There's people who will fight you over that. They'll tell you that all you've got to do is be born again and that's it. But that cannot possibly be true. There is a life to live. Everybody that's ever born again will go to heaven. Some get to stay and some don't. Because that's where they're judged. Those that live this life like we're supposed to live, it gets to stay there. Them that don't go to hell. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter, I'm sorry. Chapter 1, which was part of my message today. It's amazing how these books move around in the Bible. One day they're in one place, and the next time I look for them, they're somewhere else. Second Peter chapter 1. Let me just let me just read something here. Have y'all found it? Verse 1: Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained life. Them that have obtained like precious faith with us, with us through the righteousness of God, our Savior Jesus Christ. Right? That verse is talking about, he wrote a letter to born again people. They've obtained like precious faith. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Saved people. Born again people. All right. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And the judging part of God will be based upon what you did with the life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Look at verse 4. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these 
you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Born again people, born again people, if they do not pursue the word of God, if they don't go after the great exceeding precious promises of God, the divine nature will never have its place in your life. Well, if the divine nature is not there, what nature is? If there's no word life, there's no divine nature life. And Peter goes ahead and says as much if we just keep reading it. Verse 5 says, besides this, besides what? It says, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Well, these people had faith to get saved. We're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. God gives everybody a measure of grace, or excuse me, faith to get saved. Anybody that's ever been born again, receive from God a measure of faith to get saved. Okay. This verse 5 here says, add to that faith. Add to that faith. Virtue. Well, what's virtue? I mean, you all do your own word study and just get your dictionary, and Bible dictionary, whatever. But virtue is it's, it's really very akin to temperance. I mean, self-control, it's, 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 it's proper attitude, proper conduct, proper way of thinking, proper behavior. Add that to your faith and to virtue add knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. Temperance, again, is self-control. Add to temperance, patience. And to patience, you add to patience, godliness. And you add to godliness, brotherly kindness, and you add to brotherly kindness, charity. I'll tell you something. What you and I just read, we're just told by the Word of God, that's not going to happen to you unless you do it. These qualities are not going to show up in your life unless we add them to our life. Yeah. They come into you, mind of your life through the great deceiving precious promises of God. If there is no word life, if you don't have a Bible that, 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 that you value highly, these qualities will never be part of your life. You just have a flesh ruled, born again spirit. Mm -hmm. they, they, they use this term in the Bible school because they said body ruled. There's a lot of people body ruled. You know little babies? Little babies you bring them home. Huh? They don't have a pass. So you really can't <laughs> condemn them for anything. Mm -hmm. All you can do is look at them cross eyed and they'll cry. Their body ruled. No. Their body ruled. Well, there's a lot of Christian people that got saved and they never changed that part of their life being body ruled. Their body ruled all the days of their life. You just say the wrong word, just act the wrong way, just just you ignore them and, and just not meaning to, but you just you have to really watch every move because they'll cry. Mm -hmm. Anybody hear that way? But there, there are people born again that are that way. I know born again men, you let a short skirt walk by, they make no effort to deal with it. I mean, they cross their eyes, try to keep looking at it, but they look at it. Follow it with their mind. I'm just being real. And a ton of other temptations. <clears throat> because their body ruled. Don't you go ahead Thursday nights are free? <laughs> They're all free. <laughs> well, let's just keep reading. Well, the point I want to make there, this deal between verse 4 and verse 7, if you and I don't add that to our life, it never gets added. We have to add these qualities. Verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9 starts with the word but. The word but. Mm -hmm. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged of his old sins. What does anybody do that's forgotten that's been purged of their sins? What do they do? They just live a sinner's life. Mm -hmm. They place no value on the blood that redeemed them. I mean, if you forgot it. But they have a born-again heart in them. And right along with all the other born-again people on this planet, there's a moment coming where I'm going to stand before God and be judged for the works that we did in our body. Some are going to be called goats. Some are going to be called sheep. Some are going to get to stand in heaven. Some are going to smooth to hell. Mm -hmm. Then we can't look at it that it's hopeless because when we genuinely repent, it's gone. It's, 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 that was the whole deal. This message is repentance. <laughs> the whole thing. I've been trying to get on that for the last okay. three weeks. <laughs> it's okay. It, you know, that, that, that text fit pretty well what we're talking about tonight. But it's nothing to fear. It's just it's just because you love Jesus, you pursue him. As long as you're doing that, these qualities are working. I mean, yeah. you can't have a desire to pursue Christ and ignore this book. That'll never happen. Right. If you have a desire to pursue Christ... You're never very far from that Bible. 
It'll always be close because you love it. The Bible says they that, listen to this, the Bible says they that believe Jesus Christ is precious to them. Yes. Jesus is the living word. This is the written word. Just as the living word is precious to you, the written word is precious to you. Anything precious to you, you guard that. Anything, doesn't matter what it is. But it's just those that pursue Christ, those that love him, those that are, in fact, about, well, glory to God, man, we can get off in something here and drink, and I'd have to swim for a half day, get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Not just the word. Yeah, they are. Good. It says in verse 9, he that lacks these things, these qualities that you find in verse 4, 5, 6, and 7, anybody that lacks those, I mean, he wrote this to born again people in verse 1. Anybody that lacks those, he says they're blind, they have no vision. It says they're blind. They don't mean they're literally blind. They just have no spiritual vision. They cannot see where they've come from. They don't know where they're going. I mean, Samson, I think, is a pretty good type of that in the Old Testament. This covering that he had was his hair. He had a Nazarite vow. You can't touch anything dead or, or, or drink wine or anything that makes wine. could eat grapes. But he had a covering, and he was supposed to protect that. As long as he protected that covering, he had his strength. Well, the Bible tells you and I that Jesus Christ is our covering. As long as you protect that, you have strength to live this life. But if that covering is ever gone, if you don't protect that covering, you lose vision. You, you lose sight of who you are and who she is and who I am. And he calls himself pastor, but you know, he used to have some annoying, but I've been there and he, ain't, he don't have no the next thing you know, you go to backbiting and talking and the deal's on, gossiping and the conviction's not there. I've said it for a long time, that your Christian walk has to be maintained. Everything has to be maintained. Everything. It doesn't make, if you don't maintain that chair, just watch it. See what it does. That carpet, your automobile, your life. If it isn't maintained, it'll fall apart. If you don't maintain your relationship with Jesus, I promise you devils will show up and they'll provide you with a buzz that you really like. Because the Bible says sin's a pleasurable thing, but it'll take you smooth to hell. Do 1 Corinthians chapter something. I don't know, Colossians. Where's it at? I don't know. We'll find it. Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Let me show you something. I mean, these are some, some thoughts to born again people. That, that's what that what we just read in first or second Peter's all about. Born again people. If those qualities are at least not being an, an effort being made to add to your life, at least an effort being made, you just lose all sight of who Jesus is, who you are. Because the Bible says you forget that you've been once purchased from your sins. <clears throat> I don't ever want to be in that shape, folks. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, it said, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Well, we understand what that means. We've been saved. We've been born again. Okay? And we've been reconciled, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, I want you to look at verse 23 and tell me what the first word is. Yeah. There's a contingency. Born again, preserved, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Boy, we, we rejoice around that. But the next thought is if. Mm -hmm. Those things work if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You know what that means? You can be moved away. Yeah. You can be not grounded, not settled. You can choose not to continue in faith. You know what you can choose to do? You can choose to go get you a 357 and just go blow the world away. Talking in tongues the whole time you're pulling the trigger. You can do it. Going smooth to hell if you do. Born again or not. I'm sorry, I try to get Nana to teach you, and she won't do it. <laughs> so I guess it's my job. <laughs> no, no, I didn't try to get her to do it. But it doesn't matter what we think or don't think about. It. These thoughts are in the Bible. What do you do with them? You can't just ignore them. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 15. I sure hope what I'm looking for is 1 Corinthians 15. I'm just working on my heart up here right now. This ain't on my notes. This ain't on my notes. Verse 
Well, hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, wherein you stand. Who's that talking to? Well, verse 2 says, By which you're saved. Is that not talking to born again people? Mm -hmm. By which also you are saved. Tell me what the next word is. Yeah. If you keep in memory. Peter said, if you don't put those, add those qualities to your life over there in 2 Peter chapter 1. This year says, if you keep in memory, Peter said, you'll forget. <coughs> That's when we have church twice a week. <coughs> to keep you in memory. You know, Peter told the guys, that he, he said, I know you know these truths, but he said, I think it's right and fitting as long as I'm in this bunch, stir you up. I know you already know them, but I just want to stir you up. You have to keep in memory who you are. You're a child of God. <coughs> and you're espoused. Espoused? Ooh, that's a, that's a one of King James, I guess. But you're promised to Jesus. You're a bride promised to Jesus to be his wife. Now you got to just pull that over your natural terms and see how that works. You're engaged to be married to this guy, but hey, he ain't looking. That's, that's mean you go get a case of beer. He won't know nothing about it. She won't know nothing about it. You go flirt with somebody else and you're going to you promise to be married to somebody else. How does that work? That ain't going to work. You know what? The only difference in those two pictures is if Jesus knows about you and those relationships. I mean with the DVDs and the VCRs and the, and the internet and, and the, you know, all that other junk. Jesus knows about it. And all you got to do is flirt with that. And then when the rapture comes, hallelujah, praise the Lord, the bridegroom has come. And he says, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> By the way, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and there's this judgment thing. There ain't, there's not anything to fear and all that. All you got to do is love the Lord. Just love the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Let me show you something. I, would, I don't think I was going there. Maybe I was. I don't know. I got, I got a few minutes left here. Let me show you something in Ephesians chapter 5. Starting at verse... Uh, did I say Ephesians chapter 5? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, well, let's just start at verse uh, 17. Let's start at verse 17. And, and I, I, this is all about a husband and wife relationship down through here. And so I'm not going to... You know, it's difficult not to stop spending some time on that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to try not to. But verse 17, it says, Wherefore, ye, uh, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. That's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. Verse 19, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's a whole series you can teach on that. Verse 20, Give a thanks always for all things unto God and the, and the Father uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, the all things listed there is all things of your covenant, all things of God. I'm not going to give thanks to God for Satan and what he's doing. Yeah. No. So you have to qualify that term all things, giving thanks for all things. I mean, you know, car run over, broke your leg and kills your kids and run over the dog. And I don't know what all happened. It was a horrible accident. Well, the Bible says give thanks for all things. I'm not giving God thanks for that because the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Yes. But the other things here, just, just briefly, uh, is the, the things of God. But anyway, verse 21. Submit, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Uh, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Talk about marriage, okay? Uh, verse verse 20, uh, 21 is marriage. Verse 22 is talking about marriage. Verse 23 is talking about marriage. Verse 24 Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands and everything. Talk about marriage. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Talk about marriage. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives. Talk about marriage as their own bodies. 
He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Talking about marriage, okay? Verse 29, For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it, cherisheth it, even as the Lord does the church. Talking about marriage, verse 30, For the members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Talking about marriage, but look at the next verse. This is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. He spent a whole down in ton of verses talking about marriage, but he said, really, I'm talking about Christ and the church. The point being, anybody here ever been married, you know what I'm talking about. If that relationship works, it's because you did it on purpose. You know that? You'll work at it. That will not happen accidentally. <clears throat> He's talking about marriage, talking about marriage, 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 marriage. He's down to that third second verse, but he said, I'm really talking about Jesus and the church. And if you maintain that relationship with Jesus, you'll work at it. Yeah. Because there's devils out there, got everything in the world to dangle before you, how to hate, come follow me. And if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, go get your CD, I'll drive a truck for 30 years and come back and tell me what you found out. <laughs> I can tell you stories, folks, and if I told them, you'd say, you're a bona fide miracle that you're even in a pulpit today. Well, I feared the Holy Ghost and I had a shotgun, so I just stayed with God. <laughs> <laughs> nah, she didn't have a shotgun, you know. Well, you know, there's somebody gave me two shotguns day before yesterday. Glory to God. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. I think I'll go witness it. <laughs> Shotgun each hand. <laughs> I mean, how many remember that story about the, about the retired cop in Tulsa when I witnessed it? Y'all remember that story? How many remember that? How many want me to tell it? Did you hear that story? I'm going to tell you a story. It's pretty neat. This is a true story. <clears throat> Little Joe Darty, he, he, he died, and he's done well with the Lord. His wife's taking care of the church out there now. It's a huge church, big, big deal. But it started out just as a small thing, like, you know than every other church does. But in its early years, they had witnessing teams that go out on the street, and they go to the baddest part of town. I mean, God's God or he's not. And so this group would just go, I mean, for all the switchblades and the snub nose 38s and all the tire chains, and I don't know what all tire chains are. Long chains, and I don't know what, you know. That's where they would go witnessing the people to get saved, get right with God. Trusting the Lord to take care of them and get those people saved. Right in the middle of this, there was a retired Tulsa police officer. He got saved, and he just wanted to go with this witnessing group to learn how to witness and, and, and to just be a part of the church, just trying to help. Well, this man had been on the police force 30 years. After 30 years of being on the police force, he's trained to do things that, he, that, that his brain never gets involved. He just does it, and then, whoa, you know, the training kicks in. And so he went out on this street witnessing thing, this, you know, five or six people in the church. Bad part of town. And, and this group found this bad-looking dude. Boy, he a he, he rough, rough character. And they began to tell him about the love of God and how much Jesus loved him and what Jesus did to, you know, get him saved and died for him. Right in the middle of all that, this fella whipped out a switchblade. Man had that switchblade and was coming after one of those witnesses. 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 <laughs> well, that's when that 30 year training thing kicked into this city cop. He grabbed that guy by the, th by the, by the, by the neck, got an arm lock on, took that switchblade away from him, and stuck it to his throat. This cop did. <laughs> stuck that switchblade to that guy's throat. He said, You get saved right now. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what else to do with it. <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's a neatest story. That's a true story. That actually happened. I'll tell one of Brother John. I mean, it's just very similar. It wasn't, it wasn't about witnessing. It was Brother well, John Scaff. He's a he's a he's a really unique. Well, we're all unique, but John is the most inter interesting man. The military. He did he did three terms in Vietnam. Charlie, how many times did you go to Vietnam? One term or two? Or one time. 
John just couldn't get enough. I think he did three terms, but he was in the Navy and the Marines, and he did time in the submarines and that sort of thing. But, well, he, he did his share of combat. He, he was showing me a, a military issue of a knife that he has at his, at his, at his house. It's a bully knife, what I call it. It's about that big. But it's what, it was the original issue that they gave him in 1965, 66, 67, whenever. You know, and he still has it. And he showed me that knife. And I'm looking at that troll, that thing, man. And I said, John, I said, do you ever do surgery with this? Now he knew what I meant with surgery. I don't mean surgery. And he knew I didn't mean surgery. What I meant was, how many times have you cut flesh with this knife? And he said, 64 times. There are 64 people that used to be on this planet that are not here now. Well, that's what the war does. I mean, Charlie can testify to that because he went over there and they just, that's what you go there for, is to stop some people from doing crazy things. Anyway, we had that moment. And John, John talked about some of his military career and that sort of thing. One of the things they trained him, and I don't know how it was with you, Charlie, it may have been the same, but they, they trained him. He has a three-foot space where he stands. And if you violate that three-foot space, his brain just never gets involved. All that training just kicks in. I mean, it's just it's a knee-jerk reaction. Well, he went to visit his daughter-in-law down here in Texas. And uh, his son is in... Iraq at that time. It's been quite some time ago. And here comes one of those soldiers off the base down there knocking on his daughter-in-law's door while his son's in Iraq. Now there's something wrong with that picture. Well, when this soldier knocked on that door, John answered it. John was not supposed to be there. Well, all this soldier saw was this old gray-headed, gray-bearded man standing here looking at him. And John realized right quick what he was there for. And he began to tell him, you need to get out of here. Well, the soldier got real derogatory. In fact, the soldier just turned around and just busted John the good, just laid one on him. Which was a near fatal mistake. Because before that soldier could blink his eye, John had him flat of his back and a switchblade pulled out and stuck to his throat. He said, now you can live and walk. You can stay here and die. Which one do you want to do? What messed that soldier up so bad was this old man put him down. Here he's the elite force. I mean, he's a ranger, whatever that is. And he's so proud of his training. But this old man took him down at the blink of an eye and had a knife stuck to his throat. He said, you can, you can live and leave or you can stay here and die. Which one do you want? Well, the really good part about that whole story is two weeks prior to that, Kitty's coming in here and said, we got to pray for John. we got to pray for John. She's crying. And just, it's just every time she's coming, we got to pray for John. And, and in tears, the Lord laid something on her heart that something's going to happen here. And if, I believe if we hadn't prayed, if Kitty hadn't prayed, if we hadn't went before God with this, there'd be one less soldier in Fort Hood, Texas. Why did I bring all that up? I don't know. I just liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me uh, show you one other thing here. Well, again, yeah, let, let me just say, in Ephesians chapter 5, there's this level of commitment that's being outlined where a husband and wife is concerned. And if that commitment isn't maintained, that marriage will dissolve. And it takes both parties to make that work. I mean, good to see you. you know, you've got to know that. Look, we're in Colossians. Look, I'm gonna close with this thought here. I think. Look, Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three. Verse twelve. This is just one of many admonitions that you can find in Paul's writings. But it says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and blood. And here's, here's King James, bowels of mercy. He's talking about your, a merciful spirit, a merciful heart. Okay? But notice that first two words, verse 12, put on. Mm -hmm. 
a merciful heart, uh, kindness, look at this, humbleness of mind. We don't like humbleness of mind. We like macho. Well, then Charlie do. <laughs> I don't want you ladies like. I know some women that are so caught up in pride. And you look at me and think, I don't know what you think you got to be so proud about. <laughs> but they are. They're bound by it. Yeah. They look in the mirror and see one thing and everybody else sees something else. <laughs> Pride has got them so bound. And they can be very vicious and very vindictive. And, and, and if, you, if, you, if you violate that pride they have, boy, they get mad. Man, that hurts you. This is humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And it goes on forbearing one another and forgiving one another. But that verse, tw verse two words of verse 12 says, put on. The, N the NIV, New International Verse, says, clothe yourself with these things. Well, let me ask you something. What happens if you don't do that? <laughs> it's just, I'm sorry, I just, I'm not, I just, I'm not, I'm not, I gotta tell you things. I'm a pastor, okay? If you don't do that, it won't get done. It just won't get done. Those qualities over there in First Peter or Second Peter chapter one. All of those qualities are the character of Christ, and if we don't add that to our lives, it don't get done. How would you like to stand before Jesus someday with the smell of Satan all over you? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be a horrible thing? I mean, you live your entire life just been just following your own flesh around and just, just whatever flesh wants you just. The Bible says, they that are Christ have crucified the lust of the flesh and the affections thereof. So that's something you do on purpose. Well, it's a Thursday night message. Come Sunday and we'll shout and dance and praise the Lord and have ice cream and cake. <laughs> I don't know. We just have to, I mean, those thoughts that we just look, looked at, that goes on and on and on in the New Testament. And where people come up with the idea, just get saved, you've made it. It your future is sealed and you know you're saved. No, you just born again. The Bible uses the term saved, it's the same Greek word, sozo, it means you just you're just in a born again condition. But it's more than apparent as you read the New Testament that there's there's, there's some people who are born again going to hell. Not easy to say, and it's even less pleasant to hear, but it's the truth. If, if a relationship with God isn't maintained, like marriage, it'll fall apart. I mean, that whole fifth chapter of Ephesians, it's verse after verse after verse talking about marriage. And then he says, by the way, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Amen. Those of you on the internet, God loves you and we do too. Until next time, God bless. Amen.